Hey, my Travel Ones podcast, I'm lucky to have Ed Soares. How are you today, Ed? I'm great. How are you doing? Doing well, buddy. I've known Ed for about a decade now. I met him back in the day when I was a, a, a one more round sales rep. Uh, yeah. For those of you that don't know, Ed is CEO of LFA, Legacy Fighting How's it Alliance. Work? Alliance, yeah. Legacy Fighting Alliance, yeah. yeah. I just call it LFA. And you're, yeah, like, you're like LFA. That's what everybody does. Oh, yeah, hopefully, right? Yeah. You're like at LFA 85, 86. Is that where you're kind of scheduled out? Uh, but we're on hold? LA, we're, yeah, we we just postponed LFA 84, 85, and 86. Wow. That's a good run, though. I mean. Yeah, we uh, we produced, uh, you know, in, in three, a little over three years, we've done, uh, you know, a little over 80 events. So it's pretty, uh, you know, we've definitely been cranking. We were averaging about 28 shows a year for the first three years and then uh when we signed this new deal with uh ufc fight pass uh, mm-hmm. we're scheduled to do uh 20 shows this year and you know what we're still planning on doing those 20 shows we we, we, we will and and um you know it's just right now it's just crazy times but i i do believe uh when when i when i look at the landscape of sports uh i do feel that as far as the major sports, I do feel that, you know, MMA could be one of the first sports to get back in, in, in business and producing shows simply because, you know, I, I just feel that when you look at your traditional stick and ball sports, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, how many people you need to, to put together to, to do that when fighting technically, if need be, if we're going to produce shows for strictly for television, for people to watch at the, at the comfort of their homes and we don't have fans, I feel that uh, it's a sport that, uh, you know, you've got the judges, you've got, you know, minimal people and you've got two people in the ring and a referee. So I, I, I do feel blessed in a way to, in comparison to looking at other sports when you're looking at, you know, I, I look at like someone like the XFL who oh, man. You know, just launched their season and what, what a blow, you know what I mean? It's horrible. I, ne- I honestly hadn't even thought about that, but I can't even imagine all the work and effort and marketing that went into starting that. And now oh, dude, it's a new I, fault I mean, of their own. To yeah. Shut down. You, and, 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 and the crazy thing is, is, is you know, I, I wasn't actively following it, but, but I, I, I did, you know, yeah, I'm the same way. I watched some of it. I, I, I watched some of it and, and uh, and it was cool to, to, to see football. Granted, it, it 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 was it was different not being the NFL and not being familiar with the names of the teams yeah, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. You know, it was it was a little bit different. Like, what am I watching almost? But but at the end of the day, it's still a an, a, a, a sport. It was on ESPN. It was on a hobby. You know, major networks, and it's scary, man. It's scary to see what could happen. Well, then you think you know. All the, uh, I mean, yeah, you have the players, but like you said, then you have all the staff that that gave up other jobs to go work for that. You know, if you're totally. if you're, if you're a trainer and you're you, maybe you had a job at a local college or a high school, and 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 the local XFL team hired you, and you're like, this is awesome. Yeah, and, and couple, but but then but, but but then again, I don't think it really makes a difference where you're at. Mm-mm. You'd be out of work right now. Yeah, exactly. So, I, I mean, from that standpoint. It, it, I don't, I don't think it, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to affect as much, but it's just absolutely nuts to, to think, I mean, this is, I don't know. I don't even know what to say. This is, this is truly unbelievable. I, I would have never thought in, you know, 2020 in this day and age that we would have experienced something like this. I believe the last time our country ever experienced something of this magnitude was, what, uh, in 1918 with the Spanish flu. Yeah. And, and you know, the population was, I'm going to, what, maybe a hundred million versus 360 yeah. million. Right. Yeah. Totally. And, and, and you didn't have yeah. the world travel. You didn't have the travel that we, I mean, you used to be able to get on a plane and just, Hey, tomorrow I'm going to be in New York and then I'm going to fly down to Miami and then I'll fly over to Texas and I'll come home. Yeah. Well, so you, in Not 1918, anymore. you didn't have that. So the, no, the flu exactly. took hard, was harder to spread. Now it's just like, well, somebody in China is now in Korea, and that person in Korea is now in Japan. That person in Japan is now in Italy. You know? Yeah, 
And 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 I don't I haven't followed, but what, what has, have you heard the status of the airlines? I obviously they've been shutting you. They're gonna, down. They're going to be crushed. I mean, oh, I, I, yeah, all no. I've seen is flights with one person on it and taking pictures, saying, "I guess I have a private airplane today." Yeah, and they're on you know they're on a you know a hundred fifty, two hundred, three hundred passenger plane. Yeah, row after row. My 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 neighbors are flight attendants, and they're. They just said that a lot of their people uh, that were in training to be a flight attendant or even um, uh, pilots and, and people that work on the planes, the school, they have a yeah. school, I guess. And right. so people had to quit their jobs to go to this school so they could pass and then become, you know, I can't say the, the airline. Right. They're all <laughs> just shut down. It was like a week ago. I'm talking to them and they're like, yeah, we're trying to catch legs you know, down to San Diego or wherever. We're just trying to catch whatever legs we can. But everybody that was in training just got let got, let go until until it's over. Oh, God, man. Like, Holy well, smokes. Yeah, but, you know, and this is, this is really a economic issue for the world. You know, I mean, it's not just like our state, not just our country. I mean, this is going to impact the world. And, oh, you yeah. know, it's just, it's just interesting to see what's going to happen as far as, like, you know, property values to all these different things that, uh, just so many things, you know, I, I'm just hoping and praying that, uh, you know, we minimize the, the, the casualties and, and we just try to get back in, you know, get back to normal as soon as possible. But who, who knows? It, I, I, I really don't know what back to normal really even means at this point. You know what I mean? Because it's, uh, you know, I don't think we're ever going to be the same after this. Well, let me ask you this question, and I'm sure you're you're getting a ton of text and phone calls and emails uh, from your fighters that that you have underneath LFA. You know, obviously, a lot of the fighters I know personally don't make a lot of money. You know, no. And if a lot of them have day jobs, and well, so, most of them at this level do for yeah, sure. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, you know, I always compare what we are at the LFA to kind of like college football. Yeah. And the only reason I always com- compare it to college football is our business model is a lot like um, a AAA baseball. But but the reason I compare it to college football is, is because from a content standpoint, uh, nobody watches AAA baseball. You know what I mean? <laughs> but college, uh, and, and and I mean that in, in like, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, you'll go and watch it live, but you don't see AAA baseball on TV. On TV. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, versus college football, you know, is highly watched and, and gets high ratings. So that's why I compare it to college football more than I do AAA baseball. But our business model is very, very similar to a triple A baseball where you're not making very much money. You're making money. You're, you're, you're actually getting an opportunity yeah. and you're getting a platform to show your skills in hopes that, uh, you know, a bigger organization sees you and, and wants to sign you and scoop you up. So that's really, you know, at the end of the day, that's kind of the situation we're in, you know what I mean? So it's just scary. And I, I feel bad for, like I said, I feel bad for our fighters. I feel bad for all the fighters. Different I feel point. bad for, for the fighters that, that are fighting in the UFC that are making a ton of money. What happens with, you know, you got guys like Tony Ferguson and Khabib who, oh my God. who uh, are putting how much money into these camps to get prepared. And, and, and you know, I mean, it, it, there's always, you know, it's always worse, but it's all relative, you know. It's like, oh, yeah, I lost my fight. And people turn around and say, yeah, but you're only making a thousand bucks in that fight. True, but but it's all relative. You know what I mean? Like, oh, everything, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's all relative. You know? And then you've got a guy like Beeb who's probably making, you know, three to five million dollars, but now that's on hold. Well, that's what I was going to ask. You know, you start thinking about, you know, are, are the pay-per-view numbers going to be down because, you know, do I have $70 to spend on a, on a pay-per-view when I don't know if I'm going to get a paycheck for my rent next week? I definitely think the pay-per-view model... Uh, you know, because there's going to be no ticket yeah. sales, so I mean that's that's done. Yeah, ticket sales aren't going to be good, so that's one revenue stream that 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 could be cut out. And and um, you know the pay per view model. You know the only thing that I would say is is you know viewership I think will be up. Just but but then again, that makes sense. You know the the good thing about viewership 
is when your viewership is up, that's exciting because then the advertisers come. But if all these companies are hurting, how are they going to ask for more money to, from advertisers yeah. regardless of what your ratings are? So it's going to be interesting to see how all this plays out, you know. And, and You're and, in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, you I know, mean, so we'll, we'll see. I, I think, you know, not, not that in my opinion – accounts for jack squat but i think the way you set up lfa is exactly what needed to be done versus a competitor a competition against the big guy you went hey let me just make this platform and you've had multiple people come out of that that are just being oh, really successful yeah extremely i mean we've you know under the lfa umbrella we've, we've put you know close to 200 people just into the ufc not including you know bellator so yeah. You know, I really felt when we did the LFA, it was something that needed to get done because as a, as you know, my career started as a fight manager, I would see these guys, you know, fighting in a, a high school, you know, auditorium. <laughs> we, we've all been they'd to them. <laughs> yeah, they they fight in a high school auditorium and, and then they get the call and two weeks later, they're walking into the Staples Center with 17,000 people cheering and it's it's shock yeah. so i really did feel that by you know when, when we started this it was with the rfa and uh you know and, and my vision back then was really to to fill that void to get these guys prepared and and our vision was never oh yeah of course it's a, it, it, you need to get the experience in the ring but i really feel that there's just as much uh a, a, a side of the business outside the octagon as there is inside the octagon granted yes you have to go out there and win but then when you win you know you need, you need to, to learn how to uh, you need to learn how to uh, do interviews and learn how to promote yourself and, and and i feel that really the lfa what we've done is we've developed a, a platform and a system where these guys are not only are they getting the experience and they're getting tested. And, and that's why so many organizations look at the LFA. And if you're an LFA title holder, you know, they don't last very long because someone's signing them. Yeah, because they know on. that if, because they know that if you're winning fights at the LFA or defending a title or winning a title, you're actually fighting that sort of level fight. You know I mean? So many of our fights are, UFC or Bellator level fights, but they're just on our platform because they haven't gotten signed yet. Well, and, and like, I mean, I, I did the, I don't know if it was RFA or LFA back in Denver when I went a couple of years ago, but I think it was LFA. It was probably LFA. Yeah, I think it was LFA. Yeah, LFA, we started in 2017. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. There wasn't, I mean, kind of weird to say this, there wasn't a lot of production value it was just unbelievable at the event. Right. I mean, if, I've been to a couple of UFCs, and it's, I mean, you're right there. So it's like, and the ticket price yeah, is no, I mean, <laughs> not even, a, and every fight was good. I mean, that's, well, whoever your that, matchmaker is, they're doing their job. Oh, uh, no. Our matchmaker, um, Mark Berry, is one of the best in the business. He, yeah. You know, he, 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 he matches up the fight. Well, and that's why so many people like to watch the LFA, because, you know, you've got the, two the people that are going up there. And, and they realize that a lot of eyes are on them. So they're going to go out there and they leave it all inside the octagon. So that's why a lot of times of our fights, you know, are the way that they are and come out, you know, the, 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 the excitement and, and, and the performance of these guys, they, they leave it all in there because they know that by doing that, they're going to have the opportunity to go up. Sometimes what ends up happening is, you know, once these guys get to the UFC or get to Bellator, then they kind of feel like, okay, I got here. Now they're I very stay concerned here. about staying here. Yeah. So then what happens is, is like their concern is winning. And, and, and like most of these contracts, it's like, you know, if, you, if you're, if you're a hundred percent bonus 15, on winning 15, 15, 15 it's like, yeah. okay, am I going to go for the win? Am I going to go for the finish? and make it exciting or am I going to sit here and not risk anything and Point get the, the win out. so I could double my, 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 my money, yeah. you know? So that sometimes, you know, the way these, sometimes, you know, I've, I've heard people complain that, that the way sometimes these contracts are, are written are, are set up to, um, to, to almost make these guys 
complacent. small or make these yeah. guys complacent or make these guys fight safe instead of exciting. Uh, you know, and then you get into the if X Y Z wins this fight, he's in line for a title match. Well, he's going right. to he's he's not going to necessarily, like you said, take risk if if he's up on points and he's got you know ground control and this and that. He's not going to. He's not going to risk a position, losing a position to finish the fight. Yeah, um, because if he, as long as he wins, he gets the title shot. He gets the title shot. And exactly. He, so I that goes back to, you know, well, we're, now we're going old school because that's, how, you know, the Gracie said it's 50, 50K to the winner. <laughs> and right. everyone else, you know, hope you win. Well, yeah, 50K to the winner. And it was also no time limit, no yeah. rule. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the, you know, when mixed martial arts first started, it, 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 it really wasn't a sport. It was, you know, back in the day, it's called Bali Tudo, uh, yeah. no old bard. And, you know, and, and the reason the UFC was really created wasn't for a sport. It, it was created by Hori and Gracie to, to prove to the world that Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is the most efficient martial art that you'd know. And, if if you, I don't know what you know and you don't know what I know and we get into Let's it in the alley, I will win. And and I think Hoist, you know, even you know, even when you look at the the family lineage of of, of why they put Hoist in there, yeah, it's super it was on purpose. It, it, it was on purpose. Like if they were to put Hickson in, I mean, you know, Hickson was 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 the one in the family that was the, the man, the man. Yeah. But the problem was, is, is Hickson is, you know, five to 11, six, uh, five, 10, five, 11, you know, built, six foot built like a, and, and so if you see a guy like that go in there and they go, well, of course, look at the guy. But then you put a guy like Hoy Grace, who's six, one lanky, 170 pounds and yeah. goes out there and, and, and does it. Then that shows the efficiency of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And, and, and at that point in time, when Hoyce went out there and won those first few UFCs, it, it proved the point that Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is the most efficient uh, martial art in the world. And now it's still true to this day that if you don't know Jiu-Jitsu you're gonna and you get in that octagon, you're going to get beat. Yeah. It's that simple. You know what I mean? So, you know, and, and I think once that happened, I think it was like, you know, Horan was like, hey, man, now you're putting rules on it. You're doing this. That, that, that's not the – I never wanted to create a sport. What, what he was creating is – He wanted he to go back creating. to the garage. Yeah. You know. He, want, he wanted to just say, hey, this is really what it's about. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, but look look where it is now. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's come such a long way. How much traveling do you do for LFA? As far personally. as you personally traveling, yeah. I mean, how many oh, yeah. days a, a year are you on the road? Because oh, I mean, your I'm shows are road. everywhere. Yeah, we're everywhere. So I would say, um, I'm probably traveling um, on average. I would say ten days a month. Okay. Yeah. So right. yeah, about a, a third of the time, I would say we're probably about, you know, 100, 100, 120 days a year I'm traveling. Does that, does that include your, your managing end of it? or is Yeah, that, that includes everything, everything. Okay. yeah. Yeah, because you figure, you know, with my with the LFA, you know, we're doing 20, like this year we're scheduled to do 20 events, okay? Yeah. Out of those 20 events, I would say 18 of those events, at least, you know, let's say 17 to 18 of those events I'm going to be traveling. Typically, I'm, I'm the earliest I ever leave is normally Wednesdays. And, and sometimes, I mean, I've, I've even flown in the day of the show, you know, missed the weigh-ins and flew in the day of the show. So you're looking at anywhere from one to three days of travel, one to three days of travel on those. So you're looking at just at those events, I'm looking at almost 60 days of travel. Yeah. And then I probably got about 60 days of travel from the management side. How, how do you balance? Because I know you have two daughters like like myself. How do you, yeah. how do you balance family life being gone a third of the time. How have well, you done it? Um, well, you know, uh, you know, first of you know, thank God, I, you know, I've got a, a, a great wife that, yeah. that's an incredible mother and, and raised our kids very well. And, 
know, now it's not as much of a factor because they're older. You know, my oldest my oldest daughter's twenty two years old. She's yeah. graduated from college. She lives on her own down in San Diego and and my youngest daughter is a junior in high school and she'll be a senior next year. So um it's not as much of an issue. Um Heck, and, Ed, and, she might be a senior now. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. She might be a senior now. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's it, it. It sucks, man. I was just talking to her last night, and I just I felt really bad for all of her friends who are um, seniors in high school this year, and you know that they, they're they're not able to do their graduation, and you know I I, I feel all the spring sports. It's like how many of those seniors in high school is their varsity? You know, is, is there is their varsity year? their senior year playing baseball or volleyball. And guess what? They, they, their, their senior year of it's baseball, over. they weren't able to play. And it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking, man. My daughter's uh, boyfriend is going to, he's supposed to, well, he's going to graduate in May from University of Maryland, but they, they're not going to have a ceremony. And okay. he's, do, he's doing all the classes online right now to finish it out. Yeah, it's, it's sad, man. It's sad. I, I, I really feel bad for that. You know, that's such a, huge accomplishment in, 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 in a person's life and, and uh, for you not to be able to do it, it's just, you know, you, 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 you know, you start college and you start high school and, and, you know, the end, the end all is the, the big graduation ceremony. And, yeah. and unfortunately uh, they've done, they did all of that for that, for that, you know, that, that big moment. And unfortunately they're, they're still going to be graduated and they're still that, but they don't get to, you know, do the ceremony. And, 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 and I, and I feel for those kids. I, I really do. I feel for every person that has to experience that. It, it, it sucks. Well, Matt, I mean, I don't want to get off topic, but imagine like all the basketball players that miss March Madness their senior year. Oh, yeah, like, that's what I'm talking about. Like I, I feel nice. for those guys, man. I feel for those people. I mean, that that's just horrible. Well, even the and like you know, like we've talked about, even the coaches. Like everyone's worried about the players, but man, you got the administration, the coaching staff, the training staff. Everybody gets involved in that, and now it's just shut down. Anyways, yeah, it's just it's just horrible. So, so as far as you know, managing uh, you know the travel amongst family, you know, I, I we 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 were able to to do that, you know, and and you know we we, we took vacations when we could and. And when I wasn't traveling, and, and and I really feel that my traveling now has has really kind of cut back, you know, a little bit because I I, I may travel a little bit more as far as the uh, the amount of trips, but but the, the the length of those trips are much shorter now. Okay. Um. Where where you know there was one time where we had you know four UFC champions. And I felt that I was living out of a suitcase. And every time you travel with them for fights, you know, you're gone for the whole week. Well, you, and, and, and you're and, also and, going and, around the world. 100%. And now I, I'm, my international travel has cut down significantly. Um, and now I'm, I'm pretty much just, you know, we just domestic travel. Yeah. You're not going down to Brazil as much. You're not probably going to Japan. Nah, I haven't been to Brazil and God, I haven't been to Brazil in a while, probably over a year. Isn't that crazy to think? Yeah. I haven't been down there in a while. Now, are you set up on Europe more? You've been to Europe more? I've been to Europe more than I have uh, Brazil. That's crazy to think, huh? Yeah. Do you, you, are you set up on global entry? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's the best. That's what every international traveler tells me that. So I just want to make sure you're just another one agreeing. Yeah, for sure, hands down. It's it, and I actually, you know, if domestically the clear really makes that. You know, when you have, uh, you know, as much as we travel to have a clear and PSA pre-check, it just yeah. makes you. It makes life much easier. In LAX, I found that it's it's a godsend. I mean, it's just. I yeah. couldn't imagine not having TSA pre, but in like in oh, yeah. De- in Denver, there's been two or three times where I've gone to the pre check and it's longer than the regular line because they have so many more people checking you in at De- in Denver. In the regular yeah. line, they have like ten ten TSA agents versus the pre, they have two, so they're processing so many more people at the regular. Anyways, yeah, yeah, no, there is a Denver and uh, but you know what helps there? 
I'll tell you, in some of those airports, is the clear, the clear mixed with, uh, uh, if you have pre-check and clear, I mean, that's just like, you just cut right through the line. Yeah. Like I said, I, I use I use the, the TSA pre at uh, LAX. I'm just like, oh, I just saved 45 yeah, minutes makes, of my life. Makes a huge difference for sure. It just makes traveling better. You know, how, 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 when you started, you kind of got deep into it about 10 to 12, 13 years ago. Was when Black what House did, and um, yeah, I would say you know we you know Anderson won his title in October of two thousand six, so oh, you know it's okay, been fourteen 15 years. years. Yeah, yeah. So how have you? How has technology changed the way you travel in the last fifteen years? Uh, between apps and you know just yeah, I mean it's just the apps it, it make it much easier and and even like. Uh, you know, I, I travel on United a lot and just having like the, the convenience of like, you know, when I'm on my, uh, when I'm on my, uh, you know, app and, and, you know, you check your bags in, I mean, on my app, it has my bag tracking. It, it, it tells me like, uh, you know, like I remember I just flew back from, um, actually I was in Connecticut a couple of weeks ago for Bellator. We had four people fighting on that Bellator card that they canceled the day of the show. So I was, uh, I left Hartford, Connecticut on the 14th, which was uh, a Saturday. And then I was, my flight was delayed leaving Hartford, Connecticut, and it was connecting in Dulles, Washington. Yeah. So, so, so I, it was, one, it was crazy, man. I, I literally got off the plane. I, I, the doors were closing in two minutes. I was in a completely different terminal. Everything <laughs> seemed to work out right. Yeah. And I, I, the door was almost closed and then they opened it. Uh, the plane door wasn't closed, but the, 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 gate, you know, the, 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 the whatever jetway. they call it, the, the jetways door was, was, was closed. But when they saw, they said, no problem. So go on in. And, and, but as I'm on my, as I'm on my, uh, on the plane, you know, I, I'm like, yeah, my bag's not going to make it. And sure enough, as I'm on, in the air, I check my bag, and it already notified me, hey, your bag is on the next flight. So then when I landed, I didn't have to go and wait and, yeah, and, you were... and make sure that my, I already knew. I just went to the bag and say, hey, man, they saved my bag. They say, yeah, it's going to come. So it was, you know, th- those sorts of things, um, you know, the apps and, and, and that, that sort of convenience really life a lot easier when you're traveling and 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 i think that if you're a frequent traveler um all those little things make a huge difference you know like we talked about the tsa pre-check all those things make a huge difference Uh, and the stress level i I, you know i I joke with my daughters i go you know i get text messages now saying hey your flight's been delayed a half hour oh hey your your flight's been delayed 45 minutes i go you used to have to go to the airport and then sit and wait because yeah i mean there was no they didn't text you. I, mean, but, but, I think there was a, a number you could call, but yeah. But the the problem with that too, though, is the, where people get a little messed up. Is like they could turn around and say, "Hey, as of right now, your flight's delayed thirty minutes." Yeah. They still expect you to be there because if something changes, they do make changes. Yeah, back. yeah, they make changes. So, so I've heard people, "Oh yeah, my flight's delayed now." I'm like, I don't care, bro. Like if it happens to be, a, you know, if that's not a guarantee. So. It, what happens if something happens and they make a change and they say, okay, well, we're going to switch this plane here. Like they're going to try, their goal is to get as many flights out on time as possible. Yeah. Well, and, and they do make changes. I've had, I've had that. I've been in the airport, but it's nice. Like I get a text saying your flights now on time, uh, go to gate, you know, 30, yeah. 35 a or whatever now. Right. Right. Like, totally. oh, so they Same switch thing. planes. Yeah. It's just, it's just so convenient. You know, I, I mean, I, when you travel that much, you, 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 you know, I, I find a big benefit in, in all those little perks that you get from status to, you know, all those little things really make a difference oh, when you're finding restaurants you're traveling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, using the, the, the map programs for, for restaurants, for gas stations, for, you know, hotel, different oh, hotels, right. some comes up. Or even directions, man. I mean, like nowadays, you know, people can't, get anywhere without ways or without Google maps or whatever. Like yeah. what happens when you, how about back in the day when you had to break out a Thomas guide and, and, and figure out how to get some place. <laughs> and or you had to make sure you brought the right map. Thomas guide. Yeah. Or you had to look at a map 
to figure out how to, you know what I mean? It's just, you know, life I, is so much easier now. I, in, I in, physically in had terms. to show my daughters how to, how to read a map. Yeah. Like, like here's a map. It says go to G3. Yeah. yeah. Find G3 and then find the street. And they're like, what? And I'm like, okay, G's up there and the three's over there. Here's the quadrant. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. The, the, the kids don't know how easy they have it nowadays. Well, and, and I, I always, especially from old people like myself, you know, a, a lot of a lot of people are like, oh, technology's terrible and this and that. And I'm like, man, I, I couldn't imagine doing my job without technology. I, mean, I'm I can't imagine doing anything. Like, uh, I mean, as much, uh, you know, as much as I, uh, you know, cell phones. I mean, cell phones is crazy here. I can remember when my mom got an ATM card, and I thought, "Wow, that's so cool! <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to go to a market to to, to write a check, check to, yeah. to get money." Yeah, crazy, and yeah. That, that's just in our our short lifetime. I mean, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be great to see what what traveling. What is the difference when you're traveling as a manager versus for LFA? No, no difference, man. Okay, no difference. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. I fly on United either way, <laughs> or no, as much but, as I possibly can. I, I would think, I'm just projecting, I guess. As the CEO of LFA, you've got 8 million things going on. And you know when you land, it's 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 TV, it's it's cameras, it's lighting, it's catering, it's this, and this fighter's camp, and this and that. Versus when, you, when you're managing, you know, Brian, Ortega, or Cat, or somebody, and you show up, and you're, you're just dealing with their situation versus everybody's situation. Yeah, but you know, I, I got to tell you, being the CEO and being the manager, you're you're kind of in in different at different ends of the spectrum. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but but I feel that with LFA, you know, we have an incredible staff. I got to tell you that, like, um, I say this all the time: pound for pound, we're the best in the business. There's there's nobody better uh, than us at what we do, um, pound for pound. Because when you look at like the UFC, you know the UFC runs an incredible operation as as we've all seen. But you know they're doing about forty to forty two shows or forty four shows a year. But they have close to four hundred employees worldwide. Yeah. Okay. Then you go to Bellator, and they're probably doing about you know thirty five shows a year, domestically and internationally, and they probably got fifty to sixty uh, employees. And then you got uh, uh, a company like ours that was doing, you know, 25 to 30 shows a year and um, including our ring announcer, including our ring girls, including our cage crew, everyone, we're at maybe, well, actually now that we handle our production, we're at, you know, under 15 people. (laughs) So it's like to think, you know, like I said, we run lean. And, and, and we're efficient and we have an incredible team. Like, uh, honestly, the success, yeah, I'm the CEO. And people, oh, man, you guys are so, uh, I'll be no, honest, no. Uh, it's really my team, man. Our, our team, w- w- us working together is what makes us successful. Everybody um, that works with us knows what they have to do, take pride and in, in, in ownership in their duties. And and it just makes uh, it just makes all of our lives run so much smoother. I, I think everyone and and I I can tell you personally uh, a kid named Jake who works in your your California cage crew. Oh yeah, he once in a while he does. Yeah, yeah Jake, yeah. Jake 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 is uh, actually a, a a guy I grew up with son. Yeah. And and lately he and so I've known Jake since he was a little kid and, and he loved it. So once in a while when we would do the California shows, he'd work the doors. But now we actually we don't utilize them anymore. Oh. Um not 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 for any other reason than just because we have like our crew that just travels. travels so with it, yeah. Loved, and what happens is is that like before, um we we'd we'd hire uh cage crews wherever we go. And now we kind of have a cage crew who helps set up the cage. They work, they work the cage door during the end of the night and then they break, and then they break down the cage. But, but no, Jake is, uh, Jake Jimenez is, he's a phenomenal kid and, 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 uh, he's friends with my daughter and I was at the barbershop down here in the village and he has, you know, that's that, which one, the Riviera barbershop? Yeah. Yeah. 
You know, that's my best, that's my best friend's barbershop. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Riviera barbershop. As yeah. a matter of fact, he's, he's one of my best friends and he owns about six barbershops. Yeah. And actually him, him and I own a barbershop on Artesia in Redondo called Stormy Chop Shop. And that was his first barbershop. And that was, <laughs> that was the neighborhood we grew up in. And probably about, I would say close to 20 years ago, um, that it used to be called Miracosta Barbershop. Is it down by going um, at, aviation? No, it's, it's, no, it's actually, um, uh, right near Ringe okay. and, um, Artesia. And it used to be called Miracosta Barbershop. And about 20 years ago, um, we, uh, my, my buddy said, Hey dude, uh, the guy's closing up the shop and he goes, man, that's where we always got our haircuts. He goes, wouldn't it be cool if we bought it and kept it a barber shop? And I said, "Yeah, let's do it." Oh, that's and uh, awesome. we ended up doing it, and and it's still a barber shop. It's called Thor. And then he went off, and and uh, yeah, now he owns. He's got like I think he's got five or six now, and Riviera Barber Shop is one of them. Is that James or what? Um... No, his name is Norm. Norm. His name's Norm, and, and that's his nickname growing up was Stormy, and that's why there's uh... the one on our T-shirt it's called Stormy Chop Shop. Got it. I was sitting at the barbershop and, and Jake was in there and I didn't rec- I hadn't seen him since high school. And, yeah. And, and he's wearing a sinister shirt. Yeah. And I go, I like your shirt. And he goes, he goes, Oh, thanks. Yeah. He was uh, it's a family friend. And you know, I, 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 I'm like, so you, so you, so you work for Ed. And he's like, Oh, you know, Ed. I'm like, yeah. yeah. He was cool. And then I told him, I go, I'm yeah, Ky- yeah. I go, I'm a Kyla's dad. He goes, Oh my God. Oh uh, yeah. He's the, uh- He's a good kid, man. He, he, that kid, that kid. It's really nice to see. Uh, I believe he graduated college now, and 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 uh, and uh, I think he got a job, and so it's, I'm, I'm happy for him. He's a good kid. Comes from a good family. Yeah, and and he's into Western clothing right now. Oh, he is. Yeah, that's right. He is. So guess guess who's uh, his new best friend? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that makes sense, of course, because he's all into the like stagecoach and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. So he's like, oh, can I get some boots and? Shirts and like, yeah, yeah that's not something out. Yeah, so it's just that's a great man. Small world. I, I saw sure. the sinister shirt and I was like, oh, there's not too many of those out nowadays. Yeah, there isn't any. You know, that's one thing that uh, and it looked newer. Sometimes. So I was like, oh, that's, that's fresh. You probably you probably kept it in the bag. Those guys used to come to the warehouse and buy stuff all the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, we we have the same thing with our brands. You know. Yeah, I wear some of the old stuff, and they're like, "Where can I get that?" And I'm like, "Dude, this is like 35 years old. I bought it at a thrift shop." Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's all coming through. What What do you um? What's your favorite place that you've visited so far? I'll kind of end it with that, but uh, favorite uh, favorite country kind of yeah. Thing? Well, wherever I mean, it could be a, a state or city Moscow. or where Moscow, Moscow. Wow, okay. I love Moscow. Moscow's a cool fucking Russia is incredible. My daughter had a layover there and said it was very cool, which surprised the heck out of me. Yeah, Moscow is really, really cool. Um I I was just in Moscow in November. Um I went over there, one of our guys, the Alexander Volkov that we uh-huh. manage, um, bought and uh, I went out to Moscow and hung out there for a couple of days and no, last year, I, I, towards the end of the year, I did do a little bit of international travel. I went to Monaco too uh, for uh, uh, for a trade show. Um, it's, it's a trade show called Sporttel, where um, where you license, um, where you right. basically are licensing all your international sports content. So, like you know, NFL there, you know, soccer. Um, you know, you name it, uh, NBA, everyone's there licensing their sport. So we went out there to uh, work with distributors and, and get our content licensed throughout the world. So I got to go to Monaco, which is kind of cool. Yeah. It's interesting because you used to probably go to magic or some of the, the tr- apparel shows. Yeah, exactly. It was same, same, same gig. Yeah. It's just with, uh, with content now. Yeah. But it's same thing, same sort of magic style vibe, you know? Yeah. And then, and then you just kind of rotate into mixed martial arts, and they have their conventions and stuff. And then, yeah, yeah. Now you're and, 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 big shot. Yeah, exactly. So, but but yeah, it's basically a, a similar setup to the way Magic was. But instead of selling apparel, you're selling content. But, yeah. but we actually didn't set up a booth. 
um, what we did is we just went there to meet with distributors because some, a lot of times distributors are there. Uh, so like you've got distributors that set up booths, you've got networks that set up booths and, and you do have some people who produce the content that set up booths too. But those are some of the, the bigger ones. Like for instance, the UFC wasn't even there this time, wow. uh, but ESPN was there. Um, uh, but then you've got Bellator wasn't there this time, but glory was, um, okay. and then there's some other ones. So, so yeah, so it, it's definitely, um, definitely like, uh, the same feel as, uh, as a magic or an ASR show back in the day. This is crazy. Yeah. Cause I, I went to, I went to a pod, my first podcast convention and, uh, oh, really? it, which was very cool. It was very cool. And it was, it was interesting to, to see. I mean, from people that are like, oh, I'm thinking about doing it to, to establish people. And I met, remember um, you, the American Gladiators? Yeah. The show? Sure. And uh, Nitro, Dan Clark? Yeah, 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 I do. So I, I asked him to be on my show, and he, he, he very politely and with good reason said no. Um, he had his own thing starting up. And, and so I, I met him at the convention, and we're like, we just ended up talking, just random. And then oh, you, that's cool. Yeah, you just run into, like, you're just talking to different people, but it, it, yeah, yeah. it was very bizarre to, to go back to a, a new convention after being to different, different industries. It's all the same. Yeah. And definitely the apparel industry is, you know, as we know, has definitely changed a lot. Oof. Well, yeah. Like our, our, our big market that um, was in Denver every January just got moved to Dallas. And that's, yeah. that's a huge move for us. Yeah, totally. And yeah, everyone's freaking out and, the, 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 the manufacturers in, in Texas are happy and the manufacturers that are in Colorado and the central aren't. Yeah, I bet. You Is know. all your stuff to, uh, manufactured domestically or internationally? Uh, all of it's internationally. Almost all. I mean, yeah. 95% of it. It's, uh, right. We're based, we're getting a lot of the apparel in China. We're not going to, right. we're not going to India or Bangladesh for, I don't think any of the apparel. And right. Then, uh, some of the footwear comes out of India, not Bangladesh. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the jeans come out of uh, China. Right. Uh, our cowboy boots, the leather goods are made down in Leo, Mexico, where, oh, really? okay. where everybody, I mean, that's almost every boot manufacturer in the world down in Leon. Oh, really? Yeah. It's just, it's almost literally a, a collection of cousins that started factories 50 years ago. And they just kind of all just, that's what they do. They make boots and, and shoes, and little botinas, and yeah, that's um, yeah. There, there, there's a, I forgot where it was in Mexico. There's a big uh, area uh, uh, that's down there that that really uh, they they're, they're almost very specific to denim uh -huh. down in Mexico. And I, and there's like it, it's kind of like the same thing. It's like a family that started all these denim factories, and and then it's just kind of grown immensely. Well, yeah, you know, it's like, you know, we'd go to Magic and you'd see, you know, the, how they set up uh, different countries for the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we'd, we'd go to Mexico and you'd be like, hey, you know, and I'd go with the, the footwear guys and walk around with them. And, they were, and they'd they be talking to somebody and go, oh, no, no. Uh, but hey, go to my cousin's booth. It's too, too down. He, he'll do something like that. Yeah. And you're like, you just gave away business to your, okay. You know, we go down there. It's the same way in the retail stores up here. Yeah, a lot of them are all. I, I go up to Salinas, and they're like, "Oh no, no, uh, yeah, you can sell to them. I, that's my cousin. That's okay." I'm like, "What? Your cousin's yeah. your competition on the same street?" Oh yeah, yeah, but we sell different things. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good, man. Yeah. Keep it in the family. Well, you know, kind of similar to LFA, UFC, you know, Bellator. It's like totally your competition, but you're kind of not, you know. That, well, actually, I, I don't really look at myself as competition at all to those people. I mean, um, we, we're actually, uh, we help them in a way. Uh, we, we develop all the fighters for them. So to me, it's like people are like, oh, but you're never going to do it. No, I don't ever want to be, right. um, I don't ever want to, uh, you know, compete against the UFC or Bellator. I, not, not, that's, that's not my goal. Like, I, I like dealing with, fighters at the level that they are with with the lfa they're they're humble they're grateful they have gratitude um and 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 we become a a uh, we became a stepping stone in their career 
and and at the end of the day, when I really kind of decided to go full, you know, my main priority is the LFA. I realized that, you know, when I got into this business, like, what did I get in this business for? I, I yeah. it wasn't because of the money. There was no money in it. Uh-oh. When I got in this business, there was no money in it. I got into it because I really enjoyed helping fighters get to where they want to go. And and what ends up happening is 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 you start managing these guys and, and you, you, they get to where they want to go. You get to where, you, you know, you help them get to where they want to go. And then all of a sudden they, they make a little money and they get a little famous. Or a lot of money or a lot of famous. And a lot of famous and make all this. And then what ends up happening is that they start, you know, people start coming out of the woodworks and yeah. then they start feeling like, oh, this. And then they start. You know, in the beginning of their career, they were begging for interviews. Then, then you start getting them interviews. And they're like, I don't want to do that one. Or are they paying me? Or that? And it's just like, you know, it just it it changes. And 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 I'll be honest, I getting to the top, I got to see um, a lot of things that kind of saddened me. You know, what I mean, they made me made me sad. And 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 that's why I really enjoy working with the level of fighters that I do because at this level they're they're hungry they're, they're humble and and they always look at you as a guy that helps them get to where they want to go yeah. uh, for some reason when you become a manager a lot of times what happens is is I don't know where it happens but it happens is that in the beginning if you're taking you know your your manager fee of 10% or 15 or whatever you work out yeah. with them in the beginning is great and then all of it becomes a sudden, too much they, later. They, well, no, they wake up one morning like they're not looking at it as like, oh, you're getting up. They're looking at like they're giving you money, like you're taking money from them. Yeah. And 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 really, it's like, man, you know, it, 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 it's very sad to feel that way. Man, I, the only thing I can relate to is I coached high school lacrosse for the last six years uh-huh. after my daughter's graduated college or high school. I can I continued on and helped out the high school team, right? And girls lacrosse and lacrosse in the South Bay was new 10, 10, 12 years ago. It was brand new, and every right. kid every kid that came out was like, "Oh my god, thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you so much." I, you know, because literally yeah. when my when my daughter's my oldest daughter's freshman year in two thousand eight, there was no coach. Yeah. So the, the the girls had to train in the off season with the boys lacrosse coach who's who was a teacher there because they didn't have a girls coach. Right. And so when when they got a coach, every player was like and all the parents, me included, was like, Thank you so much for agreeing to do this and showing up every day for the girls. Everyone appreciates it. And it was a, a real camaraderie. Right. In the last twelve years we you know, Redondo's won twelve Bay League championships and CF North champs for six of the years or whatever. Very successful. So now you have kids in the club programs. Right. And and now the kids, the, the parents of the kids in the club programs who've spent money to, you know, private trainers and all this are now telling you how to coach the high school team. Yeah, ba- ba- they, based upon what their, title. yeah, based upon what their club coach told them we should be doing. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, yep, that's, well, that's, that's, that's true. My daughter's, did that whole system with uh, soccer, you know, they oh, played boy. soccer all the way up. And, you know, my daughter, is, she's a junior this year, but, you know, she's uh, played varsity soccer since she's a freshman at South. So I know, which, which is a great program. That. Yes, it is. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was the same. My, both my daughters played soccer and that's why I was kind of happy that they got into lacrosse. Cause I'm like, Oh, I don't have to deal right. with this. This, you know, who yeah. plays club and who who's on beach and who's on, you know, Fram and all these other things. Fram, exactly. Yeah. And it, it, totally. it, it invaded lacrosse and took the joy out of it. You know, you start getting those crappy emails from parents saying, um, I think my daughter should get more playing time. And, you know, her strength is really at, at attack versus mid. And you're like, yeah. are you, what? Who are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no, totally. So. So now I have my podcast and no one can tell me what to do with it, except for my wife. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, they, they'll always be able to. But my podcast is like your LFA, you know, where you get to, you, you set it up and you run it how you want to run it. Yeah. It's, you know? it's, uh, it's always nice, man, for sure. I hear you. 
What's the best way for, for people to, to follow you or, or, you know, follow LFA? I know they have, uh, yeah, LFA. man, LFA. And you can follow, uh, yeah, there's LFA.com is, is our website. Um, and then, uh, you, you can follow, you know, our, our social media. We're very active on that. So, yeah. I, it's LFA fighting, um, it, at LFA fighting would be, uh, the Instagram and, uh, you know, it's the same, same, same handle for, uh, all the uh facebook and uh, twitter all, uh, yeah all that lfa, LFA I'll, I'll i'll put the links on my website as well so people if, if they cool they listen they can just hit the link and go right to you sounds good man hey well it was, it was great talking to you Pete. good catching up i'm sure i'll see you around definitely man <laughs> or well, not for the care. next six to eight weeks <laughs> yeah well i hope so hopefully we'll be seeing each other sooner than later yeah you got it I, hey man i really appreciate the time man my pleasure, man. Take Thanks, care. buddy. Okay.